Um, we call signal processing. Over to you. Hey, thank you, Paul. Uh, so I'm Marty, and um, what I hope to talk to you about today is, can you hear me? Okay. Um, what I hope to talk to you about today is uh, holography in maybe a different way than you've thought about it before. So you've certainly heard po people talking about how they use holograms in their work. Um, and I'm going to use holograms in a, in a different way than what you've heard about. Um, but I don't know that necessarily all of you, I mean, I know that you've, you're interested in optics, but I'm not sure that all of you actually know how um, a hologram works. But most of you, when you think about holograms, this is what you think about, right? You think about, I, I look at this thing and I get this, uh, what appears to be a three-dimensional object, but it's not actually there, okay? Um, and this image here is uh, uh, one of the first holograms that Gabor made uh, when he made the first hologram. Um, and then this is something you can actually buy commercially. You can buy a kit that makes 20 holograms for 100 bucks from this company, okay? So that's what you typically think about. Um, and the way that they're formed, well, first, um, what I think about when I, when I look at these is not the pretty pictures. I think of holograms as stored interference patterns, okay? So the hologram is just an interference pattern that has been stored in some sort of media. And the way that that happens is like this. So we have a, a laser beam, um, some coherent source. We split it into two paths. One path interacts with an object. Uh, another path uh, just goes straight to some medium. You can record it. There's lots of different geometries that you can use to make this work. But basically, you store the pattern on uh, some media. And then if you want to recreate, if your goal is to recreate that object, then you just shine the reference on it. And then based on how light interacts with this interference pattern, it creates, if you look from down here, it creates the wave fronts like they were if this object was here so that your eye perceives an image of the original object, even though it's not physically present. And so because of how I look at interference patterns, what I think about them as is that these are special devices that redirect light in specific directions depending on how the pattern is stored. Okay, so this light, when it goes through this holographic plate, it bends the light in such a way that it recre recreates the wave fronts so that I can see the object. Now, with what I'm doing, I don't actually want to recreate the object. That's not my goal. I'm going to do something else with it. So what I want to do during this time is to tell you about um, sort of what I'm going to call a very novel way of using holograms to do optical signal processing with blind source separation. And then uh, I'll tell you what I'm doing at uh, Carleton right now. So before I start with, the, with blind source separation, I need to talk to you about the cocktail party problem which I'm simulating right now. You've all been to a cocktail party where somebody's having a conversation, you're listening to music and dishes and everything like that, but yet you can still pick out my voice despite those other sounds that are hitting your ears. Okay? That's the cocktail party problem. And um, it actually uh, shows up in a lot of places. Let me give you one specific example where that shows up. So here is a little girl who's wearing a magneto... Uh, magnetoencephalographic helmet. And so each of these sensors is picking up magneto magnetic signals that her brain is generating just from the currents that are moving signaling, or signaling, signaling muscles. And so each, because there's lots of processes going on in her body, each of those sensors is receiving um, information from lots of different parts of her brain. Okay? And so these, these sensors are receiving redundant information, okay? So this is what the raw sensor data looks like um, from each of these sensors, and there's different polarizations, but you can see there's a jumble of things going on. They asked her to uh, move her eyes back and forth during this first time. They asked her to blink, and they asked her to clench her teeth, okay? So clenching your teeth like that. Um, and this is what was recorded. And so there's some interesting things that you can sort of see around here or here, but it'd be interesting to know what each of the original signals look like. Okay? So what we can do is we can use what I'll just broadly call cocktail party techniques to recover the original signals from the mixtures that are reaching the sensors. So these are what the original signals look like. 
Um, so these are clearly signals related to clenching her teeth. This is related to her eyes moving back and forth. Uh, this, this is her heartbeat. This is a clock in a room that's supposed to be magnetically shielded. <laughs> okay, this is not actually inside of her body. So you can see that this is, this is very powerful for recovering information about your systems. Um, so what are other applications? So um, I mentioned sort of audio. Um, we saw biomedical applications, machine shops. You can listen to machines, catch, see if their signal changes before they're going to break so you can fix it before it's more expensive. Image processing, separating astronomical sources. So a broad range of applications. So as a physicist, I want to constrain this problem to something that I can solve. And I'm going to show you the formulism for what we call blind source separation. So in this formulation, we have two signals. And they are mixed as they propagate towards space and reach your sensor. So these would be, say, your ears. And if I want to recover these original signals, then what I do is I just multiply by the inverse matrix. Right? Multiply by the inverse mixing matrix, and I recover the in, in, uh, original signals. But there's a problem for you, that is. I'm not going to tell you what the original signals are or how they are mixed in space. All you have is the received signals, and you have to use that information in order to recover the original signals. And anybody who has studied linear algebra knows that we have uh, six unknowns and two pieces of information. We cannot solve this problem. Okay? So this is blind source separation. Um, if we couldn't solve this problem, then obviously I wouldn't be standing here. So um, you can solve the problem if you assume that the original signals are statistically independent. Okay, so if you do that, there's a mathematical definition for what that means that is written right here, and it involves statistical correlations. Okay, um, so S1 corresponds to signal 1, S2 is signal 2, so we're just looking at two signals at this point. Um, and it's for all orders of M and N, okay? So if you perform the statistical correlation, um, in fact, you just need to choose enough combination of M and N to get the additional four equations you need in order to solve the problem, okay? So this is probably the simplest, um, the, the lowest order assumption that we can make in order to have the most generalizable uh, solution to this problem. So. There are lots of different ways you could approach this. Um, the most common way is to use an algorithmic approach, um, but you could also use a dynamical system approach. If you use an algorithm, then an algorithm has a set of steps in some sort of condition um, that you analyze and determine based on that how you're going to proceed through your program. So for example, I could guess an inverse matrix, just choose some coefficients, multiply that by my recovered signals, get some new signals. I can check to see whether or not they're statistically independent to the various orders of M and N, and then use that to select, uh, to determine whether or not I've solved the problem, okay? It's computationally intensive, but you can do that, and there are people that do that. In fact, they do it a little bit smarter than just guessing randomly, but that's basically what they're doing. I'm going to talk to you about a dynamical system approach that uses holography. Um, and so from a dy dynamical system perspective, a well-behaved physical system seeks an energy extremum. So, uh, so if I have, say, a ball that's, that's damped and it's falling in, this, falling in this potential well, we know that it's going to settle at the bottom of the well, right? That's the lowest energy position that it has. And so what I want to do is I want to design a system that solves the cocktail party problem by minimizing its energy. So I'm not actually calc I'm not calculating anything. The physical system is doing what it needs to do, and it solves the problem just as a natural con a consequence of how the system is set up. So um, this is a blind source separation system that I worked on in graduate school and actually um, 
bought it for my thesis advisor, essentially, and then transferred it to Carleton. Um, and so this is an optical system that, by its dynamical properties, solves the blind source separation uh, problem. So what we do is we take uh, two independent sources. Um, you'll see a demo later where these are two songs that I've chosen. And rather than propagating them towards space and having them reach a microphone, I can just simulate that in a computer. So I mix them with a the computer, and now I have two electrical mixtures of uh, the signals that I want to separate. Well, I told you I wanted to do this optically. So I have to take that, el that electrical information, turn it into optical information. So that I, I do this with an electro-optic modulator in a, what's called a carrier suppression setup. Um, and then it goes, so this is for each of the mixtures. Then they go into this thing that is a feedback loop. Um, the feedback loop has another electro-optic modulator. It has this thing, which um, is a photorefractive crystal. It's dynamically holographic, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, there is some special energy transfer that happens because of the holographic nature. And then it turns out that the signal is phase modulated. You can't detect phase modulation with a photo detector or your eye or anything like that. So um, we have to do a little de detection trick in order to turn it to uh, amplitude modulation so you can actually detect the optical si signal on a photo detector. There's some amplification and then you re-impress the signal back on the electro-optic modulator. Okay? So um, that's, that's basically, this is the system, a little bit simplified, but a schematic of what we're going to um, look at. And we're just going to pull, because the easiest thing to do is just to tap the electrical system and output it on a speaker or into a computer <laughs> or some other device to record the output. OK, so let me talk a little bit more specifically about this photorefractive crystal. So as I said, it's dynamically holographic. And by what I mean, what I mean by that is that it, um, it can store an interference pattern. Electrons literally move around inside the medium to store intensity patterns um, as changes in index of refraction in the material. And it keeps that information. It holds on to it for a while. Okay? But if your system changes or you remove the laser beams, it'll go away after a while. Okay? So it's an adaptable holographic uh, material. And it provides gain. Okay? And by gain, I mean energy transfer. So energy moving to a different location or to a different laser beam to the extent that the beams crossing inside of, of the crystal are temporally and spatially correlated. So spatially just means the beams need to overlap. And temporally means that they have to have the same temporal character. So hopefully these animations will work. So here's our photorefractive medium. And we're going to take two laser beams that are the same color. In fact, it's the same laser beam split. They form a very stable uh, interference pattern. The crystal turns it into a grating. And so let it restart again. And so you'll see that um, where the weak beam comes out, so over here, okay, that we actually get energy transfer from the strong beam into the weak gain. Okay? Now, if I were to do this, for example, with two laser beams that are different colors, so I have a blue beam and a green beam, then the grating that's created is moving, and so the electrons get confused. They don't know what to do. And so what ends up happening is that if you um, look at what the energy transfer looks like, there's not good statistical correlation, so there's no um, energy transfer. Okay? So what our hologram is doing is allowing us, to the extent that these beams are statistically correlated, it's allowing me to transfer energy into or out of the feedback loop, OK? And if you remember, the way that we um, were able to get around this problem of not having enough information to do blind source separation was that we needed to do statistical correlations. So this crystal is actually doing statistical correlations via holography. So I think that's kind of cool. OK, so now we're just going to walk around the feedback loop. I'm not going to give you any math. I'm just going to give you a feel for how this works. And for this, I actually have to click through. So, oops, come on. No, you were just working. We'll 
restart the presentation. I will close it. Uh, don't save. I will reopen it. Okay, that's weird. I don't know why it's not working. And that's very sad because it's a really cool animation. It was just working this morning. Um, <coughs> maybe it's got stage fright. What am I doing on time? Okay, so for some reason that has become disconnected. So I'm going to just try to talk you through what happens with this main picture. So, um, so ignore all of this stuff. So here are our input beams. Um, and what happens, so let's, let's just say that we have some noise on the feedback loop. And we only have one of those beams. Then what happens is that noise gets put on the electro-optic modulator, which means noise is put on the laser beam. And that noise gets detected, goes through the crystal. Um, and the parts of the noise that look like this laser beam get amplified because they're correlated. So this beam coming out of the crystal looks more like the noise than it did before. It goes through the detector, it gets amplified, and now I have bigger noise. So if this then gets re-impressed, and, and when in closed loop, the noise just gets bigger, 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 bigger. That's bad. OK, so what I need to do is I need to make sure that the gain in the amplifiers is low enough so it just doesn't spontaneously oscillate, like what would happen if you're at a concert and the speaker goes really loud. OK, that's what you would hear, and you don't want to hear that. So you turn the gain down. Now, let's say that I put just one, um, one of the signals on this laser beam. Um, and so not a mixture, just one of the signals. Then the parts of the noise, if I start with noise here, the parts of the noise that are correlated with this signal get amplified. So now the signal here looks more like the signal that was on this beam than it did before. And so as this oscillates around, I keep putting a signal that looks more and more and more like the signal on this beam. And so that one signal gets amplified. And I just get that one signal in my feedback loop. Now, when I put different signals, mixtures of signals on here, you could imagine that I get one signal or the other, which is what I would like. I get one of the mixtures, which I don't want, or I get some random combination, which I also don't want. Turns out, if you analyze the mathematics of the situation, you can actually set it up so that it'll select one signal or the other. Or you can actually create different conditions if you want that. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you an audio demo to convince you that this actually works. So um, we mix the signals like they would be mixed, um, like if you receive them at an antenna, they'd be FM modulated, for example. So we modulate the signals, we mix them. We then take those signals, run them through the optical system. And what you're going to hear is recording in real time of what's happening in the feedback loop. OK, so two songs. There, you'll hear them for about 10 seconds. We turn the system on, and then you can hear what happens. See if you can figure out the two songs before it selects. OK. So um, it selected uh, Johnny Be Good. What was the other song? Help. OK. Um, and so this is real time. You're hearing what the crystal's doing. I think that that's pretty cool. Um, okay, 
So how do we do compared to algorithmic approaches? So, um, so these are all algorithms offline, real time. Um, this is signal separation as a function of signal bandwidth. And this is a logarithmic scale. Uh, 20 dB is a factor of 100, OK? Um, so you can see that they haven't been moving towards bandwidth. They've been moving towards separation. Um, wrong way. OK, so um, the system that you just heard was the audio system. What I did for my PhD was actually push it to radio frequency, so 20 megahertz bandwidth, real-time signal separation. So um, you might be curious as to why isn't this processor in every hearing aid in the world? Since it's real time, greater than a factor of 100 in signal separation um, on RF signals. And the reason is, is because it's huge, OK? On a two-ton optical table with the electronics above it. OK, so I went into miniaturizing um, miniaturizing uh, optical setups using photopolymers. These are light sensitive materials that um, when you shine light on them, they polymerize. And I can restore, I can store refractive index information in them. So they're like a holographic plate. The way they work is, so this material is between glass slides to hold it. This yellow material is uh, sort of gelled. It's sort of almost solid material. We have photo initiators and monomers, high refractive index monomers. If you shine light, then you radicalize the initiator. That starts polymerization. That causes uh, more monomer to diffuse in and then polymerize, more diffusion, more polymerization. And so now I have a lot of high refractive index uh, material um, in a particular region. I then shine light over the entire sample, I fix that change in index in, re in place, and now I have a dot with a slightly higher index of refraction compared to the surrounding material. The material is easy to work with. Um, you basically just slide the laser focus through it, and I just created a waveguide. Okay? And so I could move my stages around, and I could write a bunch of waveguides. And here you can see that it writes the word expo, which is the name of my postdoc advisor's research lab. OK, so I wanted to integrate photopolymers with um, writing uh, physical features like uh, fluid guides. And so um, here is a refractometer. So this is a fluid channel with a waveguide that was painfully aligned by some poor graduate student. I want to make this type of device, but all in the same material without embedding other materials inside. I could do that, but I don't want to. So what have we been doing? Um, well, I've been working on developing a single polymer for micro and optofluidic, uh, for creating optofluidic devices using mass-based lithography. We've built a proof of concept device. Um, so this is that refractometer again. And you can see that the waveguides, if I don't put a fluid channel in there, very nice waveguide, um, pretty decent output. It's not great, but it's pretty good for us. Um, and that I get different amounts of scatter if I put a fluid channel right in the middle. I get different amounts of scatter depending on whether there's a fluid in there or not. If I was an engineer, I would quantify that, but I'm a physicist, so I didn't bother. OK. So our future work, what we're doing now and into the future, is developing optical and chemical metrology to understand the material. We are exploring different uh, formulations because the one that worked may not be the best. And then hopefully we will work towards building this integrated spectrometer. Um, I've worked with uh, various people at the University of Colorado um, throughout my time at Carleton, and also my collaborators um, uh, at at Carleton include a couple of students that are here, Madeline and Ashley. Um, and so I want to thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? Good? Awesome. Okay. 
So yeah, uh, my name is Nathan Lisney. Uh, I'm a graduate student here. I've been at the University of Arizona since 2013, and before that I did my undergrad at Carleton, where I worked on my senior comps project with Marty, so we know each other pretty well. Uh, today I want to talk to you about analog quantum simulation, which I'm guessing a lot of you don't have a lot of experience with. Uh, this talk is going to be pretty high level, trying to talk about the motivations for the field and the problem we're trying to solve. At the end, I'm going to talk about the work that we're doing here, but in particular, I'm actually going to highlight the contribution that undergraduate students, students did with us during REU programs, in particular Caleb, uh, Elizabeth, and Hannah, and what they've done to try to help our simulator work and look at some of the inter interesting problems. But before I talk about quantum simulation and before I even talk about quantum computers, we need to talk about classical computers. Uh, it should be noted that analog computers were first, and I don't mean you know, these large mainframes that you might think of when you think about an old computer, but I mean back to classical antiquity. Uh, this is a picture of the Antikythera mechanism, and it's a really good example of what we believe most uh, analog computers were for most of human history, which are tools that calculate in real time navigational or astrological information. Now, with the advent of machinery in the 16th and 17th centuries, these devices became a lot more sophisticated. And on the right here, we have what is probably the most recognizable thing when any of us just thinks about a computer which is the difference engine that Charles Babbage built. And this device was really cool. You could put in a number, it'd go through and it'd do a calculation on that number, and that result would sit in a register. You could then change the computer, make it set up for a different calculation, and run that number through it again, and again, and again. In this way, you can build up a very sophisticated calculation um, through one of these mechanical devices. Now, of course, with the advent of, advent of electronics, computers changed quite a bit. Um, the 40s saw the dawn of the digital electronic computer. This is a picture of ENIAC. This is uh, one of the first machines that we believe was started up. It's hard to know at that time what the first one was. Uh, but the great part about these large room-filling computers um, was that given enough patience and cords and cards, you could set up very sophisticated calculations on these, do it on a large set of data, and then do another set really, really quickly in comparison to what you could do before. These are very powerful devices at the time. Now, that's not to say that analog computers were done. I have here a picture of one of the more sophisticated mechanical analog computers that was ever built. This is called the differential analyzer. And this device, by putting together a bunch of gears that are teeped together on rods and having them spin, could integrate functions very precisely. Now, the problem with these analog devices as we made them more sophisticated was imperfections in the way that you set up your analog computer. You can imagine if the gear ratio just isn't quite right or the gears are in a little bit of an off position, as you run the calculation through, you get a number that number is going to be a little wrong. And depending on how many of those imperfections you have and how sophisticated this calculation is, that error can compound in other parts and mean that your result, you might not really trust in it as much as you would like to. And that's not to say that analog computers went away. I mean, in the 50s and the 60s, there were still a lot of very powerful analog electronic computers that assisted with the space program, for example. But, you know, with the advent of the transistor and with how quickly uh, power scaled with digital computers, they pretty much eclipsed their analog cousins. And even if they were less efficient due to their flexibility, due to their guaranteed precision, and to their ease of use, um, they pretty, pretty much replaced every analog electronic computer that we have today. Now, that's not to say that analog computers are gone. There's actually a renewed interest in it, and I won't talk about that. But as these computers get more and more powerful, people have also tried to ask the question, you know, can we solve every problem on a computer? Is every problem that we would like to answer computable? And there are some problems we believe that a classical computer cannot solve very well. Um, one of them is factoring large numbers. You might have heard about this problem. Uh, but there are some of them that it's not even that we don't believe that we can do it well. We know some problems are impossible for a classical computer. One of those sorts of problems is actually modeling a quantum mechanical system. Um, and it's not just to say, Nathan, are you sure you just don't have a big enough computer? No. Uh, in the words of Richard Feynman, I will defer to him in saying, uh, musing on this problem. Uh, if you take a computer to be the classical kind, and there are no changes to any laws and no hocus pocus, the answer is certainly no. There is no hope for these devices to really simulate many body quantum physics, for example. So, if we want to study these, uh, these systems, we need a different computer. And that is one of the main motivations behind the field of quantum computing. Now, what makes a quantum computer different? Well, to understand that, we have to talk a little bit about how quantum computers are assembled. What, our, what the thing that's doing the information processing looks like. Uh, and we call that the qubit. So this is a small quantum system. Um, usually, uh, for the qubit, anyways, these are always two-state systems. So imagine we have some system that has a spin. It's a property. And that spin can be either up or down. 
Now, these two states should have different energy levels, so we can address and interact with them. And then we can label them like we would actually label our classical bit. We can label one of these states to be the zero state, and one of these states to be the one state. And if we're good at controlling our qubit, we can set it up so that, you know, whenever we do a measurement, we try to find out what state our qubit is in, it always give us, gives us the result that corresponds to being in the zero state. Or we can set it up in some sort of superposition, right? So there's a probability that we get the result that it was in the one state. There's a probability that we get the result that corresponds to the zero state. But the real power of a quantum computer comes from when we put them together. Uh, if I take two qubits and through that quintessentially quantum phenomena of entanglement, entangle them together, the power that they have doubles. And with every qubit that I entangle, that power keeps scaling up and up and up. Um, even for a modestly sized computer, in comparison to like the billions of transistors you have in your phones, um, systems of 40, 50, 60 qubits can already start doing things that we don't think classical computers will ever be able to do. And, you know, taking that digital paradigm, if we want to think about a certain set of operations that we do with our universal quantum computer, uh, we know that we can actually solve some of those classically intractable problems as well. We know that the factorization problem actually becomes very easy, and that actually looking at some of these quantum many-body systems, we can study them pretty well with these devices. But you're also probably aware we don't have a universal digital quantum computer today. And the reason why is they're difficult to make in practice. The state of a system is very sensitive to perturbations. It's very sensitive to imperfections that you have when you're controlling it. Um, and that's not even mentioning, you know, you have to entangle these and keep them entangled while you're doing these operations. It's a very, very touchy process. What's more, though, we need to learn how to control them as well as we can control our classical counterparts. Getting the precision and control to get exactly the state that we want and the evolution that we want to do the calculation that we want um, has been a daunting challenge. And there's been a lot of progress. And, you know, we believe that these should work, but these universal digital quantum computers are still a ways off. So what can we do in the meantime? I mean, people are building these devices with a couple of qubits that are entangled. Are there questions that we can answer before we have the whole shebang? And to do that, we have to go back to the beginning. And of course, I mean Richard Feynman, uh, who also in the early 80s, uh, in that same talk, thinking about this, said, I want to talk about a possibility that there is to be an exact simulation. That is to say, the computer will do exactly the same as nature. If we want to try to understand some sort of system that obeys the rules of quantum mechanics, why not use a computer or a system that we have good control over that also obeys the same rules? Maybe we can use that to try to say something about this other system we can't study or don't have access to otherwise. So this is the core idea behind taking an analog approach to quantum simulation. Let me make that a little more explicit. So at the top here, we have the good old Schrodinger equation. Uh, this is an equation that tells us how the state of our system evolves in time. And that evolution in time for the system of our state, or our state of our system, rather, uh, goes according to some Hamiltonian that is uh, changes from system to system. Right? So that governs how the time evolution of our system goes forward. So let's say we want to look at an electron traveling near the speed of light. This is a decently exotic system. This is not exactly easy to make in certain labs or to get access to once you've made it. If we look at the Hamiltonian, it has a structure like this. Don't worry too much about the details of it. Uh, but what I want to point out is that let's look at a very disparate system. Okay? So instead of having a single electron traveling very quickly, now we have multiple ions that are down here in a magnetic trap that are suspended there and interacting with this magnetic field. And what's more, we've turned on some laser lights. And now they're also interacting with that laser light. If we look at the Hamiltonian that governs this evolution in time, it looks something like this. And if you're looking back and forth between these two, you'll see actually there's a shocking similarity in the structure of these Hamiltonians between these two very disparate systems. So, if we can build this system in lab, and we have good control over this system, and we can get the state out of this system very easily, then maybe we can use the evolution of it to say something about this more exotic system or hard, system that's harder to study. This is the essence of an analog quantum simulation. And I should also note that people are already building quantum simulators today. So, uh, what I have here are a couple examples picked from the last uh, six or seven years. On the left here, we have uh, trapped uh, atoms and ions in an optical lattice that are doing different quantum phase transitions. Here we have a superconducting group that's looking at conductor physics. Here we have that group before that was trying to study the exotic electron phenomena. People are building these the systems and already trying to turn them on some of these problems. Now I should note that all these problems here, you can actually also study with a classical computer. We have models and you can go back and see, yeah, actually this follows our theory expectation pretty well. But these groups are on the cusp of looking at novel physics. Physics beyond the point where we can go back to our computer and get, you know, a uh, check to feel that 
you know, everything is right, everything seems to be working, that errors haven't messed up our calculation. And once we pass beyond that threshold, uh, we have to ask ourselves a couple questions. And one of them, for these analog simulators, comes back from analog classical computers. Namely that, we know with an analog computer, right, those imperfections and errors can stack up, and they can swamp out the result that we want. These systems that we're making are already very sophisticated and very sensitive. And we have no way, like our digital counterparts, to find out where errors have occurred and extract them or correct them while we're doing our calculation with these simula simulators. So we have to ask ourselves, when can we rely on the result of an analog quantum simulator? And you know, if we understand the relationship between those imperfections, how can we protect against that? Can we set up our system so that we can always get the right answer, um, even in the presence of certain errors that we do or do not know? And really, this is the question that we're trying to answer right now. We're, we want to ask, is analog quantum simulation reliable? And our approach is going to be to take a system that we control very well and deliberately mess it up in a bunch of different ways. If we take our simulator and add in different sorts of noise or different sorts of uh, imperfections, perhaps we can see if there's a well-defined relationship that we can understand and also test different ways to, uh, to keep that information safe. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the actual device that we have here and the experiments that we're doing here to try to answer those questions. Um, in order to understand what makes uh, our experiment a little bit different than some of the approaches that I uh, set up before, we need to go back to my discussion of the qubit, right? So just as a refresher, this is the core part of our quantum information processor, right? This is some two-state device that has uh, two different energy levels here that we can interact with and control very well. Uh, but the reality of most quantum mechanical systems or quantum systems is that they don't just have two states to them. Uh, they often have certain, you know, excitable states, for example, or perhaps they have other degrees of freedom, like emotional degree of freedom, that allows for a very rich energy level structure that we're usually not interacting with or exploiting. Our system uh, actually does have more than these two states. We're going to be using the atomic spin of neutral cesium atoms. Uh, so we're going to be trying to control the hyperfine state of that spin, and the addition of that nuclear spin and that single valence electron gives us 16 possible states. Uh, that we're going to be controlling in our quantum information processor to do these simulations. Uh, we call this a qdit, d equals 16 here, instead of b being the, for a binary or two. And to understand why we would want to do this, or why we would want to have a larger space, it might be instructive to look at another quantum system. So in this case, we have four qubits that are entangled together, right? And if we want to think about all the states that we could find the system to be in, kind of like the basis states, well, we can have, you know, one qubit is that spin up, maybe one spin down, one spin up, one spin down. Maybe it's down, down, up, down. If we go and count all those permutations, you'll find that there are 16 different permutations. Indeed, we, we can find a map between this system and this system and treat these as the same. This is kind of also the essence of quantum simulation, right? We want to be able to look at a disparate system and look at it on the system that we have control over in the lab. So, for many of you that have been to lab tours or will be at the Immersion Day tomorrow, you'll see this part of the experiment quite a lot. This is where the science happens. Uh, I'm not going to go into too many details about how we control the atomic spin state than just to say that we use time-varying magnetic fields to make whatever sort of evolution we would like. The executive summary of what we've built up over the past couple of years is a toolbox that we can make any state that we would like for our simulator. Uh, we can drive uh, a lot of different sorts of evolution with our simulator on demand. And we have a very good way of reading out the results from our simulator through a stern gerlach type experiment. So we have this toolbox. We have the simulator. Let's try to investigate the, uh, that, that impact. And this is where I'm going to talk about um, the two different ways that undergraduates have contributed to this research. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is this designer quantum states project that happened. So when we think about the state of our system, right, we're thinking about how the knowledge that we have about uh, our system and trying to encapsulate that in a certain way. We can, of course, write it in a bunch of different ways. For that qubit, for example, we can go ahead and take those basis states, that 0 and that 1, and write it explicitly as some sort of superposition between the two. This is one way we can represent the information that we have about the state. Um, of course, we can also represent the state of a classical system. So if we think of like a spin or a top pointed in some direction in three dimensions, if we know the direction and degree of that spin, we can know where that state is in phase space, if you're familiar with this. So, for a constant spin, that phase space is a sphere. I'm just going to show you one hemisphere of that. So we're looking dead on, on the y-axis, onto the phase space for this classical spin. I'm just going to put it somewhere. It touches the surface. And the point that that touches that is the state of our classical spin. We know everything we need to know 
about that's that state in that image in that space. Now, we're not going to be simulating a classical spin. We're going to be having a quantum spin, a much smaller spin. And with that, there is some uncertainty involved with how accurately we can specify that spin. So instead of having a single point in phase space, in quantum phase space, we're going to have this distribution where we're more likely to find the spin here and less and less likely as we go further out. This distribution is known as a quasi-probability distribution. I won't talk about why it's a quasi-probability distribution, uh, but just know that this distribution has all the same information. This distribution uniquely identifies a state um, that we would then hopefully be able to either uh, you know, evolve our state some more, get a different distribution, and see how that state has changed. So this is a good way of representing the information we have about a state, but what if we flip this problem on its head? What if we say, look, I have a distribution. I have a particular structure in phase space that I want to investigate. I want to make a state that looks like that. Can I find a state that corresponds to it? And, you know, for these ones, it might be simple to kind of intuit if you work on this a little bit. But for other things, like let's say we want to write UA on the state of our atom. Like the state that makes that, I, I certainly couldn't intuit. Uh, so we have to try to find a way to see if we can make these designer quantum states. This is an interesting control problem that uh, Caleb and Elizabeth spent time with us trying to understand. If we can make these designer states and put them in the experiment and actually read them back out, see how well we do. Uh, the short of it is, yes, you can find these, but they're rather difficult to find. Uh, what we have here on the left is just for a test state, this is what we would theoretically expect to get. And on the right, this is experimental data that we've made the state, read the state out of our experiment, and reconstructed that distribution. And they, they match pretty well. But when we try to do features that are, uh, you know, have more finer features, like if we want to write this N, for example, um, we actually run into what you want, might think about like a pixel limit in how well we can draw in this phase space. That the size of our spin limits how fine of a resolution we can get in phase space. And there are some features that are very difficult to find states or impossible to find states that we'll actually reproduce. So that's a control project that they were a part of. Now let's talk a little bit more about uh, the simulator work and what another student helped contribute. And in this work, we're going to be trying to connect uh, the behavior of our quantum simulator to classical chaos. So we're going to simulate something. We need to simulate a, a problem that is interesting, hopefully complex, that has a, a lot of interesting dynamics to it. Uh, we're going to choose this Hamiltonian to simulate. Uh, this Hamiltonian is for the kick top. I'm going to describe to you what it does by talking about that classical spin. Right? So we have our classical spin here pointed in some direction. And the first part of this Hamiltonian is a periodic rotation, every period tau, around the y-axis by an angle p. So we go from the white arrow to the black arrow here every time this part of the Hamiltonian does its work. We call this a kick. The second part is a nonlinear rotation that depends on the magnitude of the spin in the direction on the x-direction. Meaning that, in this case, we'll go from the white arrow here, we'll rotate around the x-axis, and the spin will end up up here. Now, if we do this kick in this nonlinear rotation and do it over and over again, we can try to follow where this spin goes in the phase space. And if we do that, we get a picture that looks like this. So this is a stroboscopic picture of starting the spins in a bunch of different places in phase space and seeing where it goes. And what you might notice immediately is that there's some structure here, right? This red area looks like there's a lot of these nice, periodic, stable orbits, which is good. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a very well-behaved classical system. But if we look at the other hemisphere, right, because I've only been showing you one half, we get this large blue region uh, where, interestingly, if you put a spin there and you do this kick in this nonlinear rotation, this kick in this rotation, uh, it goes around chaotically. There's no periodicity to this. Uh, and what's more, if I start in a slightly different place, it'll go in a completely different direction. So these are the hallmarks of classical chaos. Indeed, this Hamiltonian is classically chaotic and has, has many parameters where we can have this mixed phase space with both this stable behavior in some regions and this chaotic region in other ones. So this is a, a system with rich dynamics that we'd be interested to see. Does, that, does our simulator have some correspondence to that? Can we see some of these features? So as I mentioned before, right, our quantum system is not a single point in phase space. It's a distribution, but that's fine. We can still track how this distribution changes uh, as we go, how the state of our system changes as we simulate. But we noticed something interesting as we were trying to formulate this problem. And that's if we look at those quasi-probability distributions, but for the eigenstates of that Hamiltonian, right? These are the steady states that don't change under the evolution of that Hamiltonian. And what we noticed is that there's a striking similarity in the structure of those distributions and the structure we see in the classical phase space. So maybe 
if we had a way to calculate the overlap between these two, we could try to separate out these different regions in our kick top, the simulation that we want to do, to see if they correspond to these classically chaotic regions and these classically stable regions. And that's what Hannah helped us do. So she found out a way to quantify that overlap and sort the different eigenstates for that Hamiltonian. These two, for example, don't have much overlap with the sea of chaos. They're pretty much all here in the stable region. While other ones have a lot of overlap with the sea of chaos, right? So our, our quantum top simulation should, uh, might have some of these features, right? We should expect there to be some correspondence between the behavior of what we might think in the classical case and in our very, very small quantum spin case. And so that's what we did in the experiment. Uh, we want to see if we can capture that difference in behavior. So we plop our spin right in the middle of one of those regions. And then we try to measure how sensitive states are in different regions to perturbations as we evolve our simulation forward. So how we're going to quantify that is this number that we call the fidelity. This is an explicit uh, writing of what we're going to be calculating, but you can just really think about this as the probability that after evolving our system for a certain period of time, we're in the right state. If we're not in the right state, that number is lower. If we've done it perfectly, that number should always be 1. So I'm going to show you data from 10 different states that we put in different parts of this region. And I'm going to show you uh, how that fidelity changes as a function of how long we've done the simulation. The five in red here are the ones that were in the stable region. And the five in blue are the ones that were in the chaotic region. Or again, this is the region that classically is hypersensitive to errors and perturbation. And what we notice is that the states that started in the red region, I mean, we don't do perfectly. We know that there are some imperfections in our control. Uh, but they do pretty well as they're evolving on. And they don't lose their fidelity as rapidly as those that started in the sensitive region. Which is really striking, right? I mean, we have a relatively modest system in comparison to what people like to use to simulate uh, quantum many-body physics uh, with a relatively simple setup for like the kind of Hamiltonian we're looking at. And we get different results and different accuracy with our simulation even just based on where we start our state, our initial state for the simulation. So th this is really kind of the first stages in trying to think about, you know, how sensitive are these simulations, really, and what can we say about the system that we're interested in investigating? It could be the case, for example, and uh, many people and us too believe that this, this is probably true, that there are some global features that are robust, that even if that individual state is not right, maybe something like a phase transition is still always going to happen at the right place if you want to think about it like that. So even in the face of imperfections and errors, you should be OK with these analog devices. And, and our group in particular, we also want to try to look at more systems than just that kick top and see how well uh, or how our findings about this relationship between errors in our simulator and errors in the thing that we're simulating uh, correspond to one another as we try to throw different tasks at it. So with that, thank you for your time. Uh, are there any questions? The speaker of this session is uh, Dave Haneke from Amherst College, and he is going to tell us about optical control, optonic and molecular quantum states. Take it away. Thank you, Paul, and uh, I want to thank you and, and the other organizers for the invitation to come here and, uh, and talk about uh, some of my work at Amherst College. Um, uh, I I've, I've, uh, want to start with maybe two slides just sort of introducing you to Amherst College and the, uh, the other faculty in our physics and astronomy department and some of the work that they're doing in optics. Um, this is a picture that I took of, of Amherst on Thursday after my flight was canceled, and I wasn't sure I was even going to make it here, but I, I was able to make it, and it's been a, a, an enjoyable time so far. We're a, a small liberal arts college in western Massachusetts. We've got 1,800 undergraduate students. We've got about 200 faculty or so. Uh, the physics and astronomy department has eight faculty. We've got seven physicists and an astronomer. Um, and six of us are experimentalists or observationalists, all using electromagnetic radiation in, in some sense. Uh, and, and so I thought I'd, I'd tell you about the, the six of us. Um, so Ashley Carter does, does biophysics research. She works a lot with these little micron or 10 micron sized beads. And anything you can do with that, she does. She puts it in cells and looks at Brownian motion and, and look at viscosity as a function of where in the cell it is, tethers it to DNA with optical tweezers. You can then do some, some force sort of uh, experiments. Uh, Kate Follette is an astronomer. She studies exoplanets. We heard a little bit uh, yesterday about direct imaging of exoplanets with adaptive optics, and she does that sort of work. Uh, Jonathan Friedman does quantum magnetism. So this is uh, uh, a solid state crystalline sort of thing where you get, make these crystals out of these quantum magnets. Uh, uh, but it counts as optics because it's using microwaves and, and near field optical resonators or microwave resonators. Um, and three of us do sort of atomic and molecular physics. 
uh, Larry Hunter does laser cooling of molecules and looking for preferred directions in space-time. I'll have a little bit more to say about his work uh, later on in, in the talk here. David Hall does Bose-Einstein condensation, and in particular, looking at sort of topological features in this unique quantum fluid. Uh, and, and there were posters on, on both of these works uh, on Friday. Um, and I, I work on uh, uh, quantum control and molecular ions, and I'll have more to say about that uh, as we go on. So let me, uh, uh, let me give you sort of a, a, an overview of some of the things that I think are the cool things about atomic and molecular physics. Uh, there are, of course, many things that I won't, that I won't talk about. And then uh, uh, towards the, the last few minutes of the talk, I'll talk about my particular work at Amherst College and, and how, I think I fit, uh, how I think that fits into sort of the, the, uh, the major goals of, that I see uh, in the field. Just to remind you why we talk about atomic and molecular physics at, a, at an optics sort of conference, um, atoms are made out of charged stuff. And so you can push the charged stuff with electric fields. Uh, and some of those things have uh, magnetic dipole moments. So if you have an unpaired electron in your atom or your molecule, or the nuclei might have a spin with a magnetic dipole moment, so you can push them around with magnetic fields. If the spins are processing, you can have an oscillating magnetic field. That's light. Uh, if you create a quantum superposition of two atomic states that have uh, like the electron wave function uh, with two different spatial orientations, the energy difference causes that wave function to oscillate. And so now you've got an, electric, uh, an oscillating electric dipole moment, uh, and you can address that with an, uh, an oscillating electric field. And that's, again, light. Um, one of the things that I think is, is sort of the coolest development in atomic physics uh, is the atomic clock. And these, these uh, atomic clocks come in a couple of different forms. The sort of workhorse for the past uh, uh, many decades is the microwave clock, uh, uh, cesium, rubidium, hydrogen. Uh, th this is a very well-developed technology. You can buy one of these that'll get you parts in 10 to the 14 sort of precision uh, just off the shelf. These are the sorts of things that fly in the global positioning system constellation. Uh, uh, if you want to do a state-of-the-art sort of laboratory scale cesium clock, uh, you can get a factor of 100 better, and there are several of these around the world at sort of national standards lab sort of things. Um, you can get atomic clocks that are sort of smaller than a grain of rice. This is a, a picture from the original development at NIST, but this is now commercial technology. You can just buy this. Um, the, the microwave clocks and, and uh, uh, this really precise timekeeping is great if you want to keep time. It's usually talked about in like seconds since the dinosaurs were here, but that's not really what we do with these things. It's more about when you need that really good timekeeping, things like synchronization of, of telecom networks or synchronizing radio telescopes or gravitational interferometers that are really far apart. If you can synchronize those uh, by keeping time of the signal as it comes in really well, you can make a telescope with the aperture of the diameter of the Earth. And this is what the gravitational wave and radio uh, uh, telescope folks do now. Um, the future for atomic clocks is looking at optical clocks. These are very much still in the lab. You can get another factor of 100 already today uh, on that. And, and these, these get you that factor of 100 basically by taking the oscillator and bumping the frequency from microwaves to optical. If you've got such a great thing, you can, you can do those sort of synchronizing uh, networks like I was mentioning or, or figuring out where you are with the global positioning system. Uh, you can also do some really cool fundamental physics tests. And these sort of can be in, in things like uh, looking at physics we think we know and checking that we actually know it and looking at uh, sort of more speculative physics uh, that hopefully have some grounding in, in why we might look there. These, of course, are not that different of things at all, but you could imagine looking at relatively simple atoms and, and ions, uh, where maybe you can do the relativistic quantum mechanics calculations. You do the spectroscopy in the lab, and you compare the two. Uh, you can actually measure the weak force using atoms. Uh, the weak force is really weak, but you, if you measure uh, atomic frequencies really precisely in clever systems, you can see the, the influence of a Z boson, for example, in your atomic frequencies. Uh, uh, universality of free fall, you, know, you drop an apple and a feather in a vacuum, they fall at the same rate. You drop potassium and rubidium atoms, they fall at the same rate, and you can do that uh, uh, pretty precisely. Um, and, and as I said, you know, looking for preferred directions in space time because of all kinds of crazy new physics sort of effects. Um, I was, my title of my talk was about controlling things. And so if we wanted to take an atom and actually control what it's doing, uh, you can use light to do that. I don't know if you talked about uh, 
cooling at all in, your, in, the, in the school part of this, but Doppler cooling is sort of a, a basic thing you might want to do. If you have an atom and a laser that's resonant with the atom, it can absorb a photon, it gets a little momentum kick by absorbing the photon, it emits another photon and gets a random kick. Um, that's not cooling. If you detune the laser, though, now your atom just sitting there, it doesn't even see the laser because it's not resonant. If your atom's moving sort of transverse to the beam, same thing if it's moving away, you get a Doppler shift, it's even more detuned. But if you're moving towards the beam, you get a Doppler shift and it can actually shift it onto resonance. You absorb the photon, you get that momentum kick. Preferably, atoms that are moving this way get kicked that way. That slows them down on average. Um, importantly, you have these two states connected by a laser. This top one re-radiates, it gets that kick. And in Doppler cooling of atoms, it's really crucial that it comes back to that same state so you can scatter lots and lots of photons to get that sort of statistical thermal process uh, happening. You can do all kinds of more, uh, 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 more complex quantum control. We had a, heard a great talk about quantum information processing and quantum simulation just before mine. I won't talk too much more about that uh, now. I'm interested in molecules because uh, uh, there are things that molecules can do that atoms can't do. And just a, a really basic thing, if you, if you look at a hydrogen atom and you look at just a, 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 the sort of light that it emits uh, in a discharge sort of sense, you get these discrete lines, classic calculation in a modern physics course to figure out where those are. You do this with a molecule, you get all kinds of other stuff because there's all kinds of other things going on in the molecule that's different from what's going on in the atom, because in a molecule, you've got several nuclei. Um, so uh, molecules, I'm going to look mostly at diatomic molecules, so two nuclei and a chemical bond. Uh, but, uh, but you can have other things up to proteins and, and such. Um, there's still bound states of, of nuclei and electrons, still charged particles. You can still excite the electrons, just like in an atom. And in that sense, you can do all your, your atomic physics stuff with the electrons that you're used to doing. Um, but the, the having multiple nuclei gives you a few other degrees of freedom. They can rotate around each other. You can get coupling between angular momenta. The one I really want to uh, look at today is this vibration degree of freedom. And, and you can think about it as the nuclei are separated in space by a, a chemical bond. If you tried to push those nuclei closer together, they're positively charged. You get a Coulomb repulsion, and the potential energy goes up if you try to push them together. If you tried to pull them apart, the electrons that make that chemical bond actually try to pull them back together. Uh, but if you really work hard and you pull them far enough apart, you don't really have a molecule. You've got two atoms now. And then it doesn't matter how far apart they are. If you were to draw this as a potential energy diagram, you'd look at potential energy versus the distance between the nuclei. As you push them together, you get this big Coulomb repulsion, shoots off to infinity. As you pull them apart, the chemical bond tries to, to pull them back together. But after a while, it can't do it. And you get, this, uh, you get two atoms instead. Um, this sort of thing uh, uh, has a potential minimum here. And so that's that sort of stable configuration. The, the, mean posi or the, the minimum there is often called the bond length. Close to that, it looks like a little parabola. Parabolas in this energy distance sort of scheme are harmonic oscillators. And so you really get, uh, uh, just like masses on a spring, the spring is the chemical bond, the masses are the nuclei. Uh, I'll be using this in, in the work that I'll talk about uh, later on. Molecules can do uh, uh, all kinds of neat stuff. Uh, uh, some slides that, uh, uh, some ideas that, uh, that are out there are different quantum simulation and computation schemes using molecules instead of atoms because of some of the unique states that molecules have. Um, of course, if you want to do anything with chemistry, now you're already talking about molecules. And you can look out in space, and you can see these benzene rings and all kinds of crazy stuff. And you can track how they might have formed from hydrogen and all these chemical reactions. And you can actually do some of these chemical reactions in the lab uh, uh, and, and build up sort of a, a chemical synthesis for what happened out in interstellar space in these molecular gas clouds. I'm interested in precision measurements in testing fundamental physics. Um, and uh, uh, some of these systems are really clean, like an HD plus molecule, a single proton, a single deuteron, which is a proton and a neutron, and a single electron into a molecule. So that's a three-body system. You can actually do some of the quantum electrodynamics calculations for that. Um, uh, and there are other measurements that are really interesting where molecules are really adding something new that, that atoms don't have. And one that I, uh, uh, I want to call out is looking for whether the laws of physics behave the same forwards in time and backwards in time. You can't run them backwards in time, but you look, to, look for effects 
that would that would correspond to this breaking of time reversal symmetry, and uh, and one is that the electron picks up not just an electric monopole moment but an electric dipole moment uh, from this sort of thing. And the the leading experiments looking for an electron electric dipole moment all use molecules, uh, thorium monoxide, ytterbium fluoride, hafnium fluoride, the the ion, and they take advantage of a particular type of state that exists in molecules that really balances some of the angular momenta uh, against each other in a way that really helps uh, enhance uh, some of the things that you need for this, like a large electric field. You can get that in a molecule because your charges are really close together, uh, as well as some immunity to systematic effects. One of the things that I'm looking at at Amherst College uh, is down here at the bottom, a variation of constants. So you, there are these fundamental constants of nature, things like the fine structure constant that sets the strengths of, of the electromagnetic interaction, or things like uh, if you take ratios uh, uh, to get some dimensionless number, uh, many of them are, are so-called fundamental constants. And the one that I'm looking at at Amherst is the proton to the electron mass ratio. So I wanted to say a little bit about that mass ratio, and in particular, whether it really is a constant or whether it changes in time. So uh, uh, you, you hopefully know that the proton is not a fundamental particle. It's a bound state of three quarks. In the same way that a hydrogen atom is not a fundamental particle, it's a bound state of a proton and an electron. The binding for a hydrogen atom is electromagnetic in character. The binding for a proton is the strong interaction. And so these quarks are bound by gluons. Um, the electron, on the other hand, is a fundamental particle. It's not a bound state of anything as far as we know. And so its mass isn't set by binding energy. It's set by the interaction with the Higgs field. And the Higgs field is, a, is, is part of the weak interaction. And so the mass of the electron really comes from the weak interaction. And so if you take this mass ratio, in some sense it's a proxy for the relative strength of the strong and the weak interaction. Or uh, if they were to change over time, the changing strength of the strong versus the weak interaction. Why might these things change in time? That's sort of crazy. They're constants. Um, uh, many, many theories of, uh, of, of quantum gravity predict that these fundamental constants actually should drift over time, especially ones that involve extra spatial dimensions like string theory. That's my Calabi-Yau manifold. Um, uh, that these extra dimensions, if they change in scale, would lead to changing in these constants. And why would a dimension change in scale? That's what dimensions do, right? Our three-dimensional universe is expanding as a function of time. So it's still very natural for that to happen. Uh, many theory, well, a few theories of, of dark matter actually would also predict these sort of changes, but not drifts. They would be like oscillations, actually, which is kind of interesting to think about an oscillating mass ratio. Um, state of the art sort of uh, uh, looking for changes in this mass ratio. For cosmological sort of things, so you look back 10 giga years and you do spectroscopy of, of gas, molecular gas clouds and you do spectroscopy here on Earth. You compare the two. Uh, not changing or changing a little bit of debate, uh, but st uh, st uh, statistics of, of like part per billion, uh, part per million or so. Um, on the Earth, we of course uh, have sort of one year time scales, but we can do things a lot more precisely, and it's about part in 10 to the 16 per year. I'm looking to improve on, on that uh, and see if there is a drift beyond that. We talk about controlling molecules now. Uh, so if you wanted to uh, uh, try to do that basic thing with, that we did with atoms, Doppler cooling with a molecule, it turns out for most molecules it doesn't work. You've got these electronic transitions, just like in an atom. You can, you can easily dry, drive that transition with a laser, and it will radiate down. And the problem with molecules is it doesn't always radiate down to the same state. You've got these different vibrational states that it can radiate down to as well. And so to, to, uh, you can scatter one photon, but you need to scatter lots, like 1,000 or 10,000 or something like that. And so to, if it falls down into this state, you need a second laser to get it back up. And if it falls down into this state, you need another laser, another laser, and you need 40, 50 lasers. This gets expensive and hard to keep them all locked and things. So this, in general, doesn't work. But there are uh, uh, people uh, working on other techniques, and, and I'm uh, including myself in those people. But, but there are some people that have found some really cool molecules that actually do work because it preferentially decays down to that one state. And so if you're using strontium fluoride or, or terbium oxide or strontium OH or something, you actually only need like five or six lasers to, to make it work. There's work at Amherst College on thallium fluoride trying to do it. And you can even do this laser cooling with these special molecules where it preferentially comes down to that same state with some interesting polyatomics. You notice they all look similar. You've got a big strontium atom, and you've got something stuck on the strontium atom. It's an ionic bond. And chemically, the electrons pr pretty much looks like a strontium atom um, uh, because of the ionic sort of bond. 
Uh, but for most other molecules, you need some non-optical sort of control. And so in my lab, what we do is we, we trap molecules uh, with atoms. This is a picture of seven beryllium atoms and two molecules that are dark. We'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. And, and what I've done is it's sort of a collisional cooling. I can laser cool the atoms, and I can't laser cool the molecules, but if I collide the molecules with the atoms, then they sympathetically get cooled. You, I, do, I do charged particles because I can trap them. You can do that with neutral particles with a buffer gas sort of thing, you get cold helium gas, bounce them into molecules, and you can cool the molecules. Um, and there are some interesting quantum information sort of techniques, one atom, one molecule, where you can actually control the internal states of the molecules as well. Uh, the neutrals can do the internal states with the, with the collisions. So let me tell you about my particular work at Amherst College. Uh, the molecule that I like is O2+. Plus. This is oxygen like you breathe, but I take an, an electron off so it's singly charged. That's a, that big electric monopole moment I, is a nice handle. I can trap it and hang on to it for a long time. Uh, I won't have time today to tell you how I trap it. We can talk at lunch if you want to know how to trap ions. Um, but, uh, but the trapping buys some, some nice features that I'll mention in a moment. Um, the, the particular transition I'm interested in driving is the ground vibrational state to the 11th excited vibrational state in this molecule. Um, the reason I'm interested in these vibrational transitions is this proton to the electron mass ratio drift thing. Because in that mass on a spring sort of scenario, the mass, in the case of a molecule, are the nuclei. And so you have moving inertial mass of nuclei. And so if the mass of the proton gets heavier relative to the electron, the, the oscillation frequency will change. And so that's really what I'm looking for here. It's sort of a five-step process to measure that transition that you didn't repeat. And so I, I want to uh, step through it uh, uh, briefly. The first thing you want to do is load your oxygen into a trap. Uh, and I'm going to co-trap a beryllium atomic ion for that reason of cooling the oxygen. Um, and, and the cooling, uh, uh, again, is just going to be sort of collisional. Uh, uh, and then Doppler cooling the beryllium atom. To get these atoms into the, and, and molecule into the trap, there's a couple of techniques. Uh, you can take a beam of electrons and just sort of hit it like with a machine gun, and occasionally you knock an electron off, you get your positively charged thing, it's stuck in the trap. That works fine for getting things into the trap. It gets anything into the trap that's in your vacuum chamber, so it's a little bit dirty. So a, little, uh, a cleaner way to do it is to photoionize. So you take a 235 nanometer laser, you put some neutral beryllium as a gas in your, in your vacuum chamber, you have a resonant excitation in the neutral, same photon has enough energy to pop an electron off into the continuum and you're left with an ion. The nice thing about this is that only ionizes beryllium. Oxygen, we do similarly. Uh, we have a, an excitation to a, a, an excited state in the neutral. Another photon pops us into uh, uh, the ground electronic state of the ion. And the great thing about this photoionization for the oxygen is it's selective on the vibrational state, too. We're always in that ground vibrational state to start with. It's also partially selective on the rotational state, so we're in a, a, a set of only a few. Once they're in the trap, uh, we cool them to a crystal with this Doppler cooling. We call this a crystal. These are actually individual atoms, and where you see a little gap where you'd like to think something is there, there's a, an oxygen molecule there. And the reason it's a crystal is because, in general, they're sort of moving around. But as soon as the energy to go around the next ion is, is larger than kT, they don't go around anymore. And they freeze into this ordered lattice of, of atoms and molecules. And so that's what a crystal is. So we call it a crystal. Um, and then we want to actually do the measurement. So this, this ground vibration to the 11th excited vibrational state. And we do it with a two-photon process. We could do it with a one-photon process. That'd be a, a 531 nanometer laser. That is super duper hard. So we don't do that. We do a two-photon process because it's only sort of kind of hard. Um, and and uh, this is where being in a trap really works for us. It's sort of kind of hard, which means you need either a lot of laser power or a lot of time to drive the transition. And that trap buys us time. Time might be a second here. We're not talking hours. But, uh, but it buys us time. So that's what we're trying to do is drive this transition. And then we need to know if we made it. And the way that we check to see if we made it, uh, uh, we actually turn that 235 nanometer laser back on. It's resonant from here up to a state in the continuum. And it takes our oxygen molecule, and it throws a neutral oxygen atom off and leaves us with an atomic ion in the trap. If we're down here, that laser's not resonant and, and doesn't, wouldn't even reach the continuum. And so we, we keep the molecule. So at the end of, of that sort of sequence, we've got in our trap beryllium atoms still left over from the cooling phase, oxygen molecules from uh, uh, time uh, that they did, did not make the transition, 
and oxygen atoms that did make the transition and then were dissociated by that laser. We want to see what we've got. We want to analyze the mass of these things. So we turn the trap off. We put on a couple of kilovolts. We accelerate those things. They've all got the same charge, and so they get the same kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is a half mv squared, so the lighter ones move faster. And we just let them fly for some distance, you know, a meter, half a meter, something like that, um, closer to half a meter. And then we, we, we detect charge. And the first ones to arrive are the beryllium. We don't care. The next ones to arrive are the oxygen atoms. We count those. The next ones to arrive are the oxygen molecules. We count those, and we you look at the, the atom versus molecule ratio and it tells you how much of a transition you, you were able to drive. And then you repeat just stepping that probe frequency and hopefully build up a histogram like this. And then if you're in the precision measurements business, you really, really, really worry that you got the right answer, so we've thought about that a lot. Um, and uh, our, our first goal, we're, we're, we're just starting these experiments, starting to build up. We've loaded things, but, uh, but we're working on, on, uh, on actually doing sort of these, these steps. Uh, our first goal in the next couple of years is to do the best measurement on this proton to electron mass ratio drift that's ever been done in molecules. That's a couple parts in 10 to the 14. And then hopefully quickly get on to the best ever done full stop. And then the, the limit on this is looking like it's a couple of orders, orders of magnitude better than the best that's ever been done. It's a picture of our lab. We've got uh, optics tables. There's our trap. There's some, some atoms. We're moving to a new building this summer. Uh, and so the picture will change the next time you see me. So it's a, 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 it's a sort of optics-y kind of conference. So I figured I'd show off some of our laser hardware. It's, we, we have these, these nasty wavelengths. They're all in the ultraviolet. Um, beryllium to Doppler cool is 313 nanometers, really ugly. Um, there are really, uh, really nice, elegant, incredibly expensive ways to do that. Uh, and then there's my cheap, uh, but not so uh, easy to set up. But boy, once it's set up, it, it actually works pretty well. Way. I start with a diode laser uh, that's in the infrared, and I generate the third harmonic. And for those of you who have studied this sort of harmonic generation, third is hard for a CW laser. But we do it with a, with a doubling and then a doubly resonant summing stage to get to that UV. The photoionization laser is at 235, which is deeper in the UV. So you might think it's harder, but it's not, because you can buy a diode. At, uh, at twice the wavelength, and so you can, you can frequency double this diode at 235. This is an honors thesis project of, of Christian Pluchar, who's in the audience here, and, and this is his uh, monolithic r doubling cavity that, that he's designed, and we're going to start cutting the chips on that next week, hopefully. Um, and then this, this 1063 nanometer probe laser for that uh, vibrational transition is sort of a, a really nice optical clock sort of laser. Um, so you start with a diode laser, you get a fiber amplifier, which is fun. Uh, uh, you really stabilize it to the distance between two mirrors with an ultra-low expansion cavity. You lock it long-term to an iodine molecular clock. That's what we're going to do first because it's easy. Uh, uh, but then when you get more money, you get a frequency comb and an optical atomic clock um, for your comparison. Um, so. so it's sort of fun laser hardware as well. All right. Let me, uh, let me acknowledge the, the contributions uh, uh, to this work, sort of testing fundamental physics with, with, uh, with molecules. A lot of undergraduates and a postdoc, three of them are, are here in the audience with us today. Um, so I want to thank them, and I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>